Welcome back in, everybody, to the Sports Fanatic. So we and I am a fantastic Angelo again here on the Sports Fanatic News Phillies cast. As I was joined by Andrew earlier to do part one of the Sixers video, I'll be posting part two. That's going to be coming out because tech being tech. Hopefully in this one we just have a part one and tech doesn't be tech again. But fingers crossed. But Andrew, how are you doing after this unfortunate end to this series? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Obviously, not the way you want the series to go, but you got one. You're not going to, I mean, it's always tough to win on the road. Um, so I think you just got to move on and get ready for a uh, a big week ahead. Six home games this week and uh, a situation you has got to move on. And they also finally have a day off. Obviously, there hasn't been days off really mixed in for any club in the league just because of the late start. This early in the season, there hasn't been many at all. So it's nice to have the game not tomorrow, but starting off for the Phillies on Tuesday. It's also nice for me because I'll be busy tomorrow uh, with the Royals, so I don't have to worry about that. And then I can just watch the Sixers game when I come home and not watch two things and be up until 4 o'clock in the morning. So that also worked out well. But um, when it comes to the overall games, obviously – uh, in the final game, we'll get to that, the Phillies showed a lot more overall fight. But in game one, this was definitely a game that goes into the category of I feel bad for the pitcher, uh, hands, hands down, uh, because Nola did give up six hits. But overall, I did think he had good stuff. He was able to get nine strikeouts. Nelson came in and pitched well. I would assume you look at this fairly the same way. Obviously, when Nola pitched the best game of the entire series and it's in a effort you get, you get no hit in and I'm only laughing because it's just like you went from sweeping the Rockies to somehow <laughs> getting no hit in the first game by the Mets like imagine the tail of 180 turns there but um what what what's uh your take on that because I assume you kind of see similar to what I said and how like it just sucks for Aaron Nola that you weren't able to get anything done for him because he actually pitched a pretty good game <clears throat> Maybe without question, uh, Nola went out and did his job. Obviously, not the not the way of the result the team wanted, but I think it was a huge step forward with Nola, and that's the positive you take away from this game. Obviously, if there's a no hitter, you're not there's not much to take away from it. Positive note, but no, absolutely, I think you have to take away the positive with how much Nola struggled not only this season but last year. So I think that's a start you want to see him build off of the team build off of as a whole. Um, and I think that's the that's what you got to find a way. You got to find a way to take something away from that game, and that's the positive you take away. Is you get six solid innings from Nola, you get the quality start. I mean, I'm sure that's nine strikeouts is a very high number for him. Nelson comes in, does his job with two scoreless, so another positive. Uh, that's that's what I think. Obviously, the approaches of the play were, were down and not the best. Um, apparently, McGill is the next Jacob Degrom since they don't have Degrom. Uh, McGill. Must be hiding in his body to, to get this done. Yeah, he has he been. He has been electric since this year. Well, last year he was like a four. I want to say it was like a four or five or something yeah. when he came up. So he's basically like fifth starter numbers. Where all of a sudden this year he's gone from being a end of rotation guy to being a top of rotation caliber guy at least to start the season. No, exactly, and I just think our approach, our approaches, and. Here's the thing. I mean, when you have – you get six walks and can't score a run, that, that that's all about approach because exactly. obviously you're seeing the ball well, you're taking pitches, you're drawing the walks, and then that's just not – that's just not good situational hitting. And it, it's funny. I, I honestly didn't catch this game live. I was watching the, the condensed game and everything, watching highlights, and, and you, you're watching the speed version, and, I, and every inning they're, they're, there's a guy on base. That was the funny part. I was watching it with somebody, and we kept saying that. Like, every time the Phillies are coming up and stuff, there's a, there, there's a base runner almost every inning. And it's just unbelievable to think that that happened and, and no hits were, were, were in this game. And, I mean, there was first and second at least twice in this one, and you're able to come up with no runs. So that's that's just the situational approach to the, to the plate, and that, that's where I was disappointed with the offense. No, I completely agree with that. It was you, you didn't have good. You were chasing bad pitches. You were not taking advantage of your walks. McGill had three. Uh, Jolie Rodriguez, our former friend, uh, had two. Um, and then uh, a guy that I didn't really know anything about before coming into this year, and uh, 
who's actually been good in his career. So now got to study up him from Baseball Savant and learn about him because I saw how good he's been in his career as Drew Smith. Uh, so he did good for the Mets. Uh, but the you you just didn't have a good approach, and that's the perfect way to put it when it came to that, where Nola had a perfect approach against the Mets hitters, and he gave up three, three and six as a quality start. Where in, that's kind of the definition of the old school quality start, where I think nowadays, which I don't agree with, but I would think most baseball people honestly consider a quality start five. Now, especially newer age fans, where I don't necessarily agree with it, but I think that is the way the age is saying, where no was the, the if that's the case, then I would say Aaron Noel was honestly been a little bit better than people give him credit for this year because he did pitch seven. He just fell off in the seventh against Oakland. He sucked in the one game against the uh, match. So obviously that was a <clears throat> that was a bad outing. But then he did good against Colorado um, in that in Colorado. He did fine in that game. He pitched five and two thirds and or five and a third and only gave up two. He dominated Milwaukee and then did good against the Mets. So I feel like he's done fine. It was just the second game of the season after he sucked in the seventh inning. Those are the only moments that you would really point to. That sucked with Noel, where when I had that one guy, Roto Robble, and he talked about how good, where I'm somebody that looks, like, I think the best way to look at things is look at their analytics, their stats, and what you see. Otherwise, it's not the fairest way to judge somebody if you just focus more on one than the other. And sometimes you should focus more on one, I guess, when it comes to certain things between, like, sight line, I think, should be the best. And then the stats, analytics probably way a gauge a guy better than just surface stats when it comes to certain things. But... Uh, you have to use all of them to be fair, where <clears throat> um, Roto Wob kind of basically said the reason I said that his underlining numbers are still ridiculous. It's just Nola can't couldn't get the put away pitches, uh, which is why I think this game was really key because of what you said. Uh, he was able to get the nine punches where one of the big issues for Aaron Nola lately has been the put away, the final pitch, getting the final pitch of that out and working and making an 0-2 count into a 3-2 count. And that's something that I think was huge to see him have the put away pitches more in this. Well, that's my takeaway, because overall, I think it was just kind of two crap moments for Nola this season of sucking in that game against the Mets and then sucking in the seventh inning. So I've actually kind of have been higher on Nola this season than I think most people because I honestly think he's been pretty he's been our second best pitcher to Kyle Gibson I would say well Gibson's honestly been the best pitcher thus far but Nola did outpitch Gibson in this series and we'll get into that game now but I would say Gibby's been the best pitcher this far this season because I'm not going to change that based off of just one bat he had to battle through it performance and didn't have his best stuff yesterday I still think he's been our best and then Nola I would say he's been the second best but I don't know if you would agree with that yeah, I mean, it's tough to tell, tough to call. It's um, still early, but I'm just saying. I, I mean, I think Eflin's been just as good as Nola um, this season. I, I think, uh, I don't know, I haven't been overly impressed with Aaron Nola. I think I disagree with you on that a little bit. Um, again, he had a good start here uh, this this week, but he, he shows signs of three innings and he struggles. So he, he's got to learn to put a full game together, and that's my issue with him if he wants to stay in the – Starting rotation with somebody. I mean, you you look at his numbers. He gave up four runs against the A's. He only went three innings against the the Mets the first time. He only lasted five innings against Colorado, and they had a good start against Milwaukee, and then a good start against the Mets. Maybe starting to figure things out here at the end of April, but um, no. Overall, I, I don't. The, the starting rotation for the Phillies hasn't been overly impressive as a, as a group. So to say you're the second best in, in, a, in a mediocre to below average. Uh, starting rotation. I don't know how much of a positive well, that's that fair. is. That, that's fair. I just think he's been better. I think he's been better than what you're saying is the only thing that we both don't see the the same. But that point's definitely fair. Where I, I think in the A's game also, I don't look at that as necessarily four and six. I look at that more as he just fell apart in the seventh. So, like, I think there's there's just two different ways because if he, if he came out in the six, you would look at that completely differently. And I'm not saying he should have came out, what, what not. We don't have, that. that's that's pointless. But uh, the, to argue, but if he came out in the six, I think that is a game you definitely look at as a 
quality start at that but point. So that that's my point, though. I mean, he he's supposed to be your ace, if not your second best pitcher. And what he does is he's putting together a, a solid five, five, three to five, five innings, and, third, and then he falls yeah. apart. You got to be able to go <laughs> deeper if you want to be a team's ace in, in a starting rotation. And that that's where it's been concerning. Outside probably the Brewers start. I mean, that's what he did against the Mets. If you go back, those first three innings were pretty solid for him. And then all of a sudden in that, that fourth inning. Oh, no, I agree. Third, that's why he could only go so, five and a third instead of one. Yeah. yeah I, but. So that's my point. He's like, he's got, to, if he wants to be a, that, that pitcher we need him to be, he needs to start putting together full games. And that's what he hasn't done this year. Like, yeah, his strikeout numbers are fine. He, he's. I mean, I'm not worried about strikeouts. He's got 34 strikeouts in 27 innings. He strike, yeah, his, he's got the movement on his ball, but the problem is he's becoming too predictable late in the game, and that, that's where he's got to get better I agree at. with that. I think he should change that up, but I do think his last two starts, he's been the best with that against Milwaukee and now the Mets, so it's moving in the definitely the right direction, where earlier I think he was fine in six against the A's, sucked against the Mets in his last start. So it's also good to see him bounce back against a team he sucked at in his last start, also in their home stadium. So that's another thing that was kind of nice to see as well, where I feel like he's moving in the right direction, but I also feel like there's only been a select few pitchers that have gone deep into games just from paying attention around the league this year, just because of the stretching out and all that stuff where Mad Max has been one of them, but he's also a freak of nature. Uh, he didn't do it necessarily in our game, but like he's done it already. Kershaw obviously pitched seven and the Gibson pitched seven, but there's not a lot of seven inning games yet. And then the complete game by Walker Bueller uh, because of just the short and spring training. So I think that also plays into it. But I agree with you where that would be a concern to me this early. Him not pitching as deep into games isn't a concern to me as much as I just want him to be effective in the in NG pitches because if that would be more of a concern for me if that's still the case next month when he should be stretched out more and everything should be clicking on all cylinders. And, like, the first month of the season, I don't try to fully gauge anybody because it's the first month of the season where I think we even mentioned it on our podcast. There's been a lot of stuff said about you have to be in a solid spot of the standings by Memorial Day because usually you don't make up a plethora of a crap ton of games down, minus, like, the Phillies example against the Mets and a couple of examples in history, but it's not plenty for baseball history. But the Phillies are only one game below 500 now, so all things considered, they have time for that to grow. Uh, I definitely agree with you that that, that's a concern if it continues for me. I'm not necessarily tripping on that that much yet, that I feel like he's done well enough for me to feel positive about Nola going forward. It's just, he's not. I'm not there yet to call him the ace again, but I also don't think he is our ace anymore. I feel like once Wheeler snaps back into it, and I'm not necessarily concerned about Zach Wheeler at this point yet either. I just think he's coming off of an arm thing, an arm basically tiredness from last season and is a power pitcher. So it's going to take him a bit to amp it back up when he didn't even bar- barely be able to participate in a short and sprint training and wasn't a full participant. So I think all those things factored in play into some of the struggle bunny start. That's why I'm so impressed with how Kyle Gibson pitch because he adjusted from a bad year when he came here compared to Texas and he even openly admitted he wasn't as good here and then has been very solid for us minus this game against the Mets that um we're about to get into but before we get into that game I guess I'll ask you is it too early because for me it's too early to trip about it but is it too early to really get worried about Zach Wheeler are you actually worried about Zach Wheeler at this point I think it's too early to get worried about him. He he missed all of spring training. Um, obviously, we want to see him do better, but this month of April is basically spring training. Yeah, let's see what he does his first start or two in May, and then I think we can hit the panic button. No, I completely agree with that. That's uh, that's literally basically the exact way I would look at it, and that's why with Nola's deepness in the games, I'm not necessarily uber concerned about it yet where if that was happening still around memorial day and he's only going five and a third because he had a bad inning in there like you were saying then i'm definitely going to be on the same lines with you at that point but um that's the beauty of these podcasts it's not great to disagree or it's not great to agree all the time because then it's not fun where we don't have those cool back and forth where where it's fun to have some things we do disagree on but um we're getting into now the fun game of this series which actually oddly enough 
It's a game that James Nord, not because James Nord would stepped up. He's actually pitched fairly well for us early. I'm not trying to discount him. I'm not saying oddly enough for that reason. But oddly enough, the guy that's been the more consistent pitcher for us this season, Kyle Gibson, actually had his worst start of the season where he was able to battle for us. So I always give guys credit for that, where he didn't have his best stuff clearly. Walked five people but was still able to battle through four and a third. So I'll give him credit for that. He obviously did not get a quality start, obviously in anybody's eyes, my eyes were the eyes of the wall, but at least he was able to battle for us to get through it. Alvarado came in and had a six fifth inning strikeout. I think it was of McNeil um, as he was able to end that. Norwood came in, he got the win, pitched great. Dominguez pitched great. Familia pitched great, has the most mound appearances on City Field. So he got to add to that. Uh, Knabel pitched great to get the save and still has an under one ERA. So that game was like perfection for me because obviously we got the four runs, which is plenty of enough. Uh, Reese Hoskins and Kyle Schwarber, who we both want to see heat up, started getting going in this game. And then for Schwarber, it carried into the last game. And Hoskins also had a hit in the last game, so carry for both actually. And then Oduble had the double, who's been hot since coming into the lineup hitting wise. Um, I would say this game was kind of all positives, uh, at least in my own opinion. Yeah, Minus big, Kyle Gibson not getting a quality start, I should. Yeah, I think it's a big shout-out to the bullpen. I think the bullpen did something we haven't seen in a while. Nobody's going to give him credit. I think a shout-out to Joe Girardi. He he pulled all the right moves here, pulling Gibson early, even with the even giving up the run on the air, going to Alvarado for the two strikeouts. With a switch hitter and a left-handed hitter coming up, he went with the speed and the fastball, so I like that move. Norwood came in and pitched well. Again, Dominguez coming in, getting out of a jam. Familia gets puts two runners on. Knievel comes in for the four-out save. So Joe Girardi picked all the right pieces here, and it came through for him. So very good to see see that there from from the manager standpoint. Reese, I, I, don't know if I, I don't know if I can say he's getting going. He had one hit in the game. Obviously, it was a home run. Um, I, I don't think they really jump started him at all. Um, we need to see Reese him get Schwarber. going more. Which one are we both, of them. both of them. Both, uh, both, both of them. Both of them. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, Schwarber has power numbers. At least they're still up there. But Hoskins has been pretty bad so far this year. And, and you know, I love that guy. You know, I love Reese Hoskins as a, as a whole. A Dubois, like you said, yeah, he's off to a great start. I'm interested to, to see how much longer maybe we, we ride Segura in, in the uh Leadoff spot with how well the Dubles hitting. He's obviously hit there before. He's a guy you could switch uh, switch up there to the top um, with the guy hitting, hitting the ball well right now. Because listen, your offense starts with your leadoff hitter, and so far, once again, that's always been the problem. And we'll see when we can get that going. So that that's my big concern right now. With this offense is we need to find a solidified leadoff hitter. And right now, Segura hasn't been the answer. Kyle Schwarber clearly wasn't the answer as he's hitting below 200. Who do you go to next? Maybe it is her. Yeah, I think I think he's probably the next obvious decision for the leadoff spot. I do think, and again, um, for someone that it took a minute to um, realize I need to start giving them more credit, it's odd that I'm going to be the one defending this man right now. But uh, I do think Gene Segura got screwed by his injury because he was doing fine, got injured, came back, and hasn't been able to find it again. Where I think... For that reason, too, I agree with you that eventually Oduble might move to the leadoff spot because it's probably better to try to find it again, not in the leadoff spot, than it is in the leadoff spot. So I think for that reason also, it would probably behoove the Phillies to even think of that move because Segura, to me, looked fine and then got banged up and, of course, didn't hasn't looked the same since. So I think he's going to get back to find in his swing. It just might not be the best spot to have somebody in the leadoff spot that's trying to get back to finding their swing uh, either. But So I definitely agree with you in that. That's just kind of me giving a, a, a different perspective on it also. Yeah, no, that is true. And like you said, I think it is easier to find it in a spot you're more comfortable with too, no matter what that is. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, if it's no, second, it is the like, game. yeah, if it's second, if it's sixth, if it's seventh, yeah, well, whatever, uh, you're able to find it there. Um, but I do think because I title this um, like our pl- like a player analysis and series recaps as we went into talking about a lot of guys and how they're doing on the season, uh, so then we'll be able to do that. But boom, to me, ever since the I bleeping hate this place, <laughs> and uh, he stood up to the media and did something that 
people support it because I don't think anybody, honestly, at the beginning really knew how to react to that. Like they, I don't think most people ever saw a Philly athlete. Like, like you, had, like people thought it was going to be the Sean Rodriguez effect, but with a guy that's actually good, like where like he probably would have just stepped back and not admitted like what he said and kind of stood on his like, like kind of like stood up and like admitted what he said basically. Where Bone was the exact opposite, and that got him the respect of the fans. And ever since he was hitting fine to begin with, but he's been even hitting better. And now all of a sudden, he's never going to be a great fielder. Let's be honest. Like, let's call it spade and spade. If Alec Bone becomes a great fielder, then I'll be very happy to eat crow. But, like, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. But he's been making the more routine plays, especially in the Rocky series and in this series. He still makes some mistakes, but he even made that one diving play that saved a run. Yeah. So he's definitely looked more comfortable at third ever since the fan base has been truly, really behind him, too. So I think it's odd to say but it's actually been a blessing that he said that so he could then have that moment with the media that then really rallied the fan base behind him because I've never seen an athlete handle something like that that flawlessly. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I think he played it right and he's able to get back on track and, and he, this team needs it need him. So I think it's, it's huge for him to be able to do that. And, and I think it's important. It's something, like you said, we don't see that too much. Yeah, we don't we don't see it enough uh, from guys that kind of admit their wrongdoing. It's also nice to have because, like Crucky said, I think when he was on the telecast, because I'm pretty sure the first game he came back up active in was the last game of the Rocky series, but I might be incorrect on that. But Quinn, when healthy, obviously adds good pinch hitting, good fielding ability off of your bench, and he also has uh, been able to get a base knock. And knock one in um, as well and have two stolen bases. So he was a good factor to manufacturing a run in the one game as well. So it was nice to see him steal two bags, which is what you expect from Roman Quinn watching him from his R fills, the pigs, to whatever day. So maybe if he can stay healthy, because we know that's the biggest key with Roman Quinn. It's not really his talent, it's his health. If he can stay healthy, um, maybe he can become that solid pitch and bench guy because you don't really need much from him this year. You just need the pinch. And so it's not like you're going to have to overexert him. Where in the past stuff that kind of led to his injuries was we kind of did have to overplay Roman Quinn a bit because we just didn't have anything else where you do have, even though he's not hitting the best, but he has got better in the last five games starting to have better swings. And then you do have Veerling, who's a good fielder as well. So you don't have to put Quinn in as a fielding replacement. You could just use him as a pinch runner more so. And you do have Odubel Herrera, who's doing very good, obviously, right now. So I think he fits into this roster, if that makes sense, much better than our past one. So it doesn't set him up as much for injury because of just his career history. But that's but yeah. that's kind of just how I feel about it. That's a good point. I think he's been really good. So far, what we've seen, and I think you saw what he was able to do the other day when he bunt, stole two bags, and scored on a sack. Exactly. Yeah, that's what that's I'm just, saying. That's a guy you need on yeah. your team. No, I agree. And that's why I think they need to start running some of these other guys that also have a little bit more speed, which they have this year, which I give credit to Joe Jordy for that, too. I think the Phillies are top four or top, or, or top three in, like, Steal it. Actually, they might be the top team in steal percentage, but they're one of the top teams in steal percentage, regardless. So, like they they have been doing a good job of running the base, but I think they could do it more with like when he gets on base because he's more been getting on base by walks. He has to start hitting better as a contact guy. And Andrew knows how much I love this guy is Veerling because he can run. Odubel obviously could run a little bit more. He's more of an anticipator stealer though, rather than being very fast. Uh, and then. Quinn is as fast as lightning, and I think they said ranked as like the fourth fastest guy from his first from his home to first, and that's coming off of two major injuries. So obviously, you know, this guy's a freakish athlete. It's just about him staying on the field and staying healthy. So I think we do have more depth this year. It's just obviously, I think the reason why this team is a game below five hundred after losing the final game of the series is more just inconsistency in play this far, which, which is fine in an early season. Obviously, they have to step it up going forward, but that's kind of why they're one game below 500. It's not because I, of, I think, any roster formation. I think it's more just once everybody kind of comes consistent as one at the same time, like you see the Mets, for example, doing the start this season that got them to 16-7. and seven. That's going to really propel the Phillies as well. No, 
No, absolutely. And that's what they need to find. Is something what, what can what can propel them. That's what this team is missing. And they need to find quickly. Yeah, and I think it's other guys picking up because the one thing, <clears throat> and I feel like Ryan Howard, because he was on the uh, cast with um, A-Rod and uh, Michael K, I guess is, I think is his name, the, the but the K-Rod cast on there that I watched where I assume he meant to say somebody else. I think he meant to say um, maybe, I don't know what other guy he meant to mention, but he mentioned Cassianos and how he needs to get going. I was like, well, Nick Cassianos actually is one of the guys on our team that doesn't need to get going because he's hitting 300, but I think he meant to, I think he got, because it seemed like he got locked up by saying somebody in his head that I think he probably meant to say somebody like, I don't know, say Gene Segura or something. Like, I, I don't think he meant to say Cassianos, but that's what came out, so that was definitely an interesting uh, thing, but I think you just need to see the Gregorius minus this game in the series has seemed to be bouncing back good from his injury. Uh, so that's obviously a positive to see for the Phillies. Bohm's been great. Herrera has been great. Quinn's been good in limited action thus far. We need to see Schwarber, like you said, step up. We need to see Reese step up. We need to see Segura get back to the hitter he wants to be. And Harper obviously was able to hit a dinger um, in today's game so to bring up his average and everything. So if he can start really getting going, that would be helpful as well. But I do think the bench is honestly looks solid because now you got Quinn added to it, plus you got Johan Camargo uh, when he's not starting uh, in there as well, who's been able to add not just fielding, but has been a stellar hitter early and kind of, uh, I don't know if it'll last all season, but has flashed back at the plate to his 2018 season. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, yes, and I think that's the most important. Yeah, I think, I think that's a key thing for the Phillies to have um, depth for sure. And they also have depth in the bullpen because, like we mentioned, Norwood getting that win in the second game. But Lottie's been a presence of pl- uh, pleasant surprise early. Um, plus, you have the guys you expect to be solid, like your Alvarados, your Familias, uh, your Brad Hands, obviously your Knable, who's been great early. So, um, but that combined with the fact that you're getting more depth pitching, Nick Nelson should be thrown into the depth pitching as well. Um, that that really helps your bullpen. Where I think I said in last podcast, but this is truly the difference between when you have a Dombrowski at the helm uh, to, to to a Mac Glentak. They know how to find these rough around the edge guys that you just need to fine tune a little bit to become solid relievers. And they end up bringing them into the organization where the new guys don't necessarily find those guys because they need to learn how to scout those types of guys where new guys are not usually as good at doing that. Unless it, and Glenn tack was, unless if you're like one of the raised guys. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think having Dombrowski has made a huge difference of being able to not just get depth on our bench, but depth in our pen definitely as well. Yeah, it's been huge. I mean, it's something they need to continue throughout the season. Um, it is depth. It's something they've lacked for years, and they continue to lack. And um, we'll, we'll see if they're able to pick it up as it continues to be a weaker spot for the most part. I mean, until we see what they're able to do. Obviously, this year you, you go out and get Camargo, and he's playing better than everyone expected. And like you said with the pen, but we'll, we'll see what happens with them. But they've had a good few games. We'll see if they're able to continue it. Yeah, I agree. And now as we wrap up uh, this podcast, we're heading to our last game. To someone in Eflin who we kind of expected coming off of injury probably wasn't going to pitch the deepest in the games in his first two. That came to fruition. He only pitched four innings. Then he pitched five and two-thirds of solid ball against the Rockies um, in his first start against the Rockies in Colorado. Pitched an even better game at home against the Rockies of six innings, only one run. And then in this game... Uh, he, his problem was his sinker just wasn't – his sinking fastball just seemed to – also, I think he relied on the four-seamer sometimes too much to guys that were not Frenchy because it was working really well with Lindor because he was getting thrown off by it. And then with other guys, you shouldn't have mixed it in as much because Lindor, it seemed to work really well at the game plan with other guys when they tried to mix in his flat four-seamer rather than the sinking fastball. <laughs> It didn't seem to fool anybody other than Francisco Lindor, which is odd to say since Francisco Lindor is probably the best hitter on the entire damn match. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the point being is I think this was just an off game for Eflin. Uh, 
early on, he's coming back off an injury. He had two good starts before this. I'm not going to over worry about his pitching this early in a season, but this wasn't a good start. He left his sinker up. He relied too much on his secondary pitches, I think, in moments of this game. But it, but it, 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 it kind of just boils down to early in a season when you're one game below 500. I'm not going to over trip about it. It is what it is. Alvarado didn't get helped out. Yes, JT got crossed up, but you could tell from his reaction. You can usually tell from players' reactions how they feel that he was pissed that he still didn't catch that and knew he should have caught that. And then he gave up a hit up the middle to Dominic Smith. So it kind of unraveled uh, there. Brad Hand did pitch a good inning. This was James Norwood's worst game of the uh, season where he came in and gave up uh, three runs, only two earned, but three runs. And then Sanchez came in and basically just kind of ate up the garbage innings for you, which is useful to have, where he gave up a run doing that at one and a third and three hits. So it wasn't the best, but at least ate up some garbage innings for you. So this this was just kind of a bad game uh, all in all from the pitching, minus the fact that Brad Hand pitched really well. It was an off game from everybody else in the stand. Yeah, I don't, I'm not even ready, ready to call it a, a bad game for Eflin. I, I thought the defense was horrendous. They, they didn't pick him up at all. Uh, Segura had a really bad error. Um, sorry, Segura had a really bad error in this game. Like you mentioned, JT allowed that one ball to go by him. So I, I get it. He wasn't like crisp like he usually is. But I mean, I thought, like you mentioned, Gibson, I thought he battled through certain situations. He got no help from anybody, which uh, I think really set him back a lot. I, I thought tonight was on – I know it looks good with the six runs at the end of the game, but I thought the offense was bad today. Um, overall, from an overall standpoint, you look at it, only three batters the entire – three at-bats the entire game with runners in scoring position. Um, I, I get it. Obviously, Scherzer was on the mound. You put up a four spot on Scherzer, which is good. But another high strikeout night for this offense with 11 – um, so I, I was disappointed overall from the whole team, if I'm being honest. Um, obviously, outside hand and Alvarado coming in throwing well. But, um, yeah, uh, Sanchez gets sent down to AAA after the game. Obviously, uh, well, his early season struggles. So It makes I, sense. Yeah. I, I was disappointed from the defensive effort tonight. I think that really didn't help anything with Eflin, obviously, with, with not having the sharpest stuff. But it doesn't help either when you can't trust who's behind you. No, and, I agree with and, that. And sorry, one of the and, errors and a double was... error and a double error misread a ball horribly, which doesn't go down as an error, but it cost uh, Eflin another out, and I think two runs scored after it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Odubel has been um, not doing the best, but I, I, I uh, uh, when it comes to fielding all the time, but hitting, he's been killing it. But that's kind of what I said about Odubel, though. So I'm not surprised. I'm still pissed that it happened, obviously, but. Like I think I said that even when we even when we talked about a double on the last podcast, if he starts hitting, you still got to take the gripes of the fielding with him because he's definitely not the best at running routes in the outfield of all of our options. Like he's he's definitely not the best at doing that. But if he's going to hit this well, you're not going to take him out of the lineup for how Veerling's hitting right now or Quinn because Quinn should be more of a bench player just for his health reasons. So, uh, let alone anything else. So. <clears throat> Yeah. I agree. So that's kind of just got, it is what it is. You got to take what you get and uh, get what you get kind of type thing where uh, in the outfield, he's not going to be a stud, but uh, at the plate, he's been pretty good. And he's made some decent coming in on the ball plays in the outfield this far. I do think Odubel's main issue is going back, like you were saying, like trying to pick up those routes where a guy, you have to make those over the shoulder or running catches all the time. He's not the best at reading those where you almost have to run like an NFL receiver on a deep pass where he's not always the best at reading those plays where that is an issue for fielding. But I think overall, there's only been like two plays I can really point out where I'm like, damn, oh, dude, well, I really think he should have got that. So that's better than usual for him in the field where his hitting also is astronomically great right now. So you got to give credit where credit's due as much as, um, I'm still trying to fully forgive Odubel for his wrongdoings. I still got to give credit where credit's due. So, um, the the he definitely is doing a good job at what he's supposed to be doing. Where his strength is hitting, it's definitely minus the first couple years of his career where he's better at fielding. Since he when he was ever since he's come back to baseball, since of his legal issues, he hasn't necessarily been a great fielder since his first couple of years in the league. 
No, exactly. I completely agree with that. And, and that's what's hard about it. even when he does something right. It's like it's tough to forget what he what he did off off the field. Obviously, he it sounds like he's been trying to fix it. So hopefully, he continues to trend in the right direction with that. And like you said, um, yeah, I think you said it perfect with that. And that's from that standpoint. Yeah, and I think in this game you said it right. Eflin did battle. He didn't have the best fielding. Um, so I mean, I think that uh, is a great way to put it. But I think the Phillies—it's a—it's an early season series. It's in City Field. It's at home. They were able to steal the middle game, not steal, but play a good middle game to win. The offense—I agree with you. They scored some runs early on the Schwarber home runs. Harper had a home run. It was all homer centric. Then Camargo hit a later home run. You obviously, I think there's still something to, as the announcers even said on the telecast tonight, um, th- there's something to, like Quinn was able to do in the second game, manufacturing runs still, even when you have a power happy offense, because th- th- that's kind of what did them in tonight. They relied too much on the home run ball because, as you said, there wasn't enough opportunities with guys in scoring position. And you can't always just rely on a Paul Bunyan style offense. Basically, you have to have a little bit more to the dimensions of it than that. No, exactly, uh, and that's what uh, and that's what stinks sometimes when you have a whole new group like this come in. It takes them a little bit to kind of get that rhythm um, rhythm back and everything. And uh, I think we're we're seeing it right now, and they're trying to battle through it, but no one has clicked yet really at the same time. So. I think we just got to give it a little bit of time. By the end of, I think by the end of the May, you really see this team get going. Yeah, I hope so. I think they've showed signs. They've just been, like I said, it's kind of just been inconsistency. But it's only you're eleven and twelve. You're only a decent bit of games in for a hundred and sixty-two game season, obviously. So uh, I think there, obviously, there's still a long way to go. They're six and four in the last ten, so they have been playing good in the last ten collective game. So. I think we're trending in the right direction already. And if you continuously even have six and fours in your next tens, you're then continuing the trend in the right direction. You would obviously like to be a little bit better than that in one of those 10 year game stretches, but you're still doing good at that point. If you're trending two games above 500 each time you're trending in the right direction. So I think the team's moving in the right direction. I seen positive signs uh, in this inconsistent early season, because I think Eflin, I think Nola, and all these guys, I definitely really think Wheel is definitely going to get back together. And Suarez, we, I think battling, we talked about how Nola and Gibson battle through, or not Nola, Gibson and um, and uh, Eflin battle through starts. Suarez is a guy that I think has battled it all season, but has been able to at least get us into some fourth innings by never being able to find his full command yet because he, of course, like Wheeler, didn't have a spring training either. So... Once all these guys, that would kind of be my final point, too. Once all these guys kind of collectively get going in the pitch rotation on top of the lineup, the Phillies have a very dangerous team. And even Alex Rodriguez gave us credit. So that's when you know you have a pretty dangerous team. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I think it's – obviously, you got to get going soon. You can't wait too long. I, I think this next weekend is going to be huge, obviously, with uh, – Another four games set with the Mets. You're gonna have played them ten times in the opening opening month, really, with how late the season started. So it's gonna be a big one this the upcoming week. I agree, but if you had, did you have any other final points you wanted to say? Uh, because you can follow the great Andrew at Andrew at AJ underscore Santangelo, I should say, on Twitter. But did you have any other closing points? Uh, no, just I, I think this team's gonna turn it to another gear here shortly. Obviously not. The series we wanted, but overall, solid week. Yeah, you finished the week with the uh, four-game sweep over the Rockies, uh, and then one win over the Mets. So you go, go five and two for the week. So obviously, again, the Mets series makes it seem a tough, tough one with how the week ends. But overall, great series. Uh, or, sorry, great, great week. Excuse me. Um, great week, and I think this team is going in the right direction, and they're starting to figure some, figure some things out. So I think uh, people need. People need to be excited with this group. I think uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get going here. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, for me, you can follow me at JJ Bora twenty six again. He's at AJ underscore Santangelo. This has been the latest Sports Night News edition of the Phillies. As we check in on the team doing a series analysis on the Phillies and Mets series, but also 
player analysis is as well as we talked about different guys and where they're at at this point of the season and where we think they're going to go and trend heading into the month of May this season and the month of June as we head into the summer months and so on. So forth, we hope you all enjoyed this episode. Please continue to subscribe. Keep the channel growing to the goal of 250 or more by the start of the great summer month of June. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe and enjoy the great weather that we've been getting lately if you have the great weather in your area. Otherwise, just enjoy the great sports, the baseball, the hockey, and whatever other great action you watch between basketball, et cetera, et cetera. Peace out, everybody.